Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you for coming to this afternoon's forum on the focus of China. Okay. Um, as you know, China is a magic word in the last 15 years, a word that attracts a lot of attention. In the investment market, in the last 10 years or so, people are queuing up to do things in China. It was virtually like, if you're too slow, you're out. The market has changed. We have the euro crisis, as the speaker mentioned this morning, and we have the Chinese government trying to uh, put austerity control, try to slow down the economy a little bit to curb inflation. So we're having a changing arena for the market in China. And is this bring us to today's topic, the implications and of the financial cycle and the change of policies, how does it impact um, the investors' decisions, what are the challenges, and what are the latest opportunities? I'm sure this is everyone who is potentially looking to China or has invested in China would like to know a bit more. And today, we have invited six very experienced investors in China. I've known them for many, many years. I would like to just briefly introduce um, from the far end, Mark Chu. Mark Chu is the CEO of um, the ARA Asset Management Limited company. Okay, and then sitting next to him is Kui Kuang Meng, which is the uh, CEO of Maple Tree Group, based in China, and he look after China and India. And then sitting in the middle, very familiar face, Richard Vanderbilt. He's been in my panel in the last three years. Every time he's there, he's one of the most experienced. Uh, investor uh, who date back more than 20 years of experience in China, investing into uh, different types of infrastructure and assets. And he's the country manager and the head of the real estate for the um, CBRE investor, um, um, global investors. Sitting next to him is Ryan Bodger. Ryan Bodger is the senior managing director and the head of real estate for Christmas Spire. He's based in Shanghai. And he's going to tell us something about what, what he's doing in the second tier cities later on. And to the right hand side of Ryan is Stanley Ching. Stanley Ching is the senior managing director and also the um, head of real estate growth for City Capital Holdings Limited. Stanley is based in Hong Kong, but he travels to China every week. Sitting right next to me is James Chow, head of China for Arch Capital Management. Uh, he's based in Shanghai. And six of them, I know them for years, and they do different things. Something that I know, something I don't know, but today we have an opportunity for them to tell us a bit more what they are doing. Um, not to waste any more time, I would like to throw out the first questions. I would like to ask uh, Richard, how do you see the China market now with all these changes happening? The financial market, the government policy, is it risky or is it opportunistic right at this point of time? Please. I don't think that the uh, China market has become more or less risky than, uh, than before. Um, I think the, the fundamentals in the market, if you look at, at demand, if you look at, at areas like urbanization, if you look at, at economic growth, um, they're still there. High savings rates, um, so the, and an enormous need for any type of quality real estate, any type. So I think the, the fundamentals haven't changed over the last year to two years. What has changed is the government interaction into the market to basically cool it off, to make sure that, and not just the real estate market, the general economy. Um, and that has resulted of a squeeze of liquidity a squeeze of liquidity on all sides, on the demand side and on the de uh, supply side. Developers have found it more difficult to obtain loans, to obtain financing, um, and in a lot of areas, in particular the real estate market, um, buyers of residential have been prohibited from buying through all kinds of uh, regulatory measures. So that has resulted in general in land prices coming down considerably. Depending on the city, uh, we can see land prices have come down between 0 to 30, 40 percent. 
Um, pricing of products, completed products, have come down as well. In general, again, between maybe 0 to 30 percent. Um, and from our point of view, that is a very artificial correction. It is not a market correction. It is a correction imposed by the government. And that creates now, we think, an opportunity over the next year to maybe two years to get into the market, acquire land at, we think, very attractive pricing. And when over a period of three to five years the market corrects again, that liquidity gets back into the system, um, we think that, that pricing will go back to their old levels. So where in normal circumstances you already would be able to get, I think, decent returns for opportunistic investments, you now have an ability over the next two years to invest and on top of that get an additional return. So how has the market changed? I don't think the market has changed. How have the opportunity changed in, in my probably last five, six years of investing in China? Um, I haven't seen over the last six years a, um, a kind of market condition as favorable as it is now. Right. Um, uh, Kwame, do you want to add on that about the market in China? Well, I uh, agree with uh, Richard. I think um, the same thing here is that we are seeing that there's a lot of opportunities now to work with the government to get land. And, um, and the type of uh, opportunities that we see would be a larger mixed development where we would build um, industrial as well as commercial and retail and then some residential. And it's, how say, self-sustaining, right? So the residential, for example, uh, would not be speculative in nature, but supporting whatever the industrial and commercial that we built to support the growth in internal consumption and all that in China. So that, that I see that still as an opportunity, that, as what Richard has said. Stanley, I know you have invested in a lot of growing areas like uh, Henan and also in other second, third tier cities. What's your read about it, I mean, from what you're doing? Well, um, basically, I think, you know, we, when we have this pre-meeting, we said, uh, any comments, please refer to Ronnie Chan's speech this morning. <laughs> so, but basically, I think we are doing things. Uh, we've been investing in China since 2005, you know, 3 million square meters, 18 projects but we speed up the investment pace uh, since the end of last year. Since the end of last year, we actually made uh, two acquisitions of uh, uh, residential uh, uh, sites and uh, one uh, retail properties. I think what we see is uh, very similar to uh, Richard's comment. Basically, we think this is an opportunity for um, you know, experienced investors to get into the market because the fundamental has not changed. The urbanization is going on. The rise of the middle income is happening. And, uh, you know, the second tier cities, particularly uh, we, we call it, you know, the provincial capital cities, the more advanced uh, in terms of dev uh, economic development, uh, those cities, uh, they are, you know, outpacing the, the first tier city in terms of the GDP growth. The real demand is still there. And, uh, but I think one thing that uh, uh, we, we have changed in terms of underwriting is, um, I think two years ago, three years ago, you can somehow uh, forecast a annual uh, at least uh, 10 to 15 percent of a price increment for the, uh, for the housing, uh, the, the price you're going to sell. But now we want to do it uh, more conservatively. I think the, we want, we'll project a very moderate growth of the price as well as maybe it'll take a bit, little bit longer for you to complete the whole project. So, but the, the, I think the fundamental is there. Um, if you look at all the balance sheets of the Chinese developers today, based on their land value, based on their construction cost, based on the sales price today, after the correction, you are still talking about a 25 to 30 percent gross margin. And uh, once you lower the price 5, 10 percent, you, you will see people queuing up to buy. Those, you know, without a, a mortgage or with a, with, a, with a mortgage loan. So these are the fundamentals that we are looking at. Um, particularly, we are now focusing a bit more on the, the retail sectors because we see uh, the retail sectors is more uh, we'll benefit more from the government's uh, policy because you know, China certainly is changing its uh, economic growth pattern 
from a domestic, uh, from a uh, uh, export oriented, from uh, uh, a strong or heavy uh, uh, infrastructure investment to domestic consumption. So uh, Chinese government is doing everything, you know, by providing a better social safety net, by increasing people's minimum wage, th that to promote the domestic consumption. So we are, you know, looking at uh, actively in the uh, retail space. So, so th these are the opportunity that you spot, retail, second tier cities, great end user demand because the sheer volume of the population in China. So those on the mantle will stay, from what you just said. Yeah, I, actually, we, we invested quite, quite substantially in the uh, residential, and, you know, now and, and, and before. Um, the numbers don't lie. Um, you know, the, uh, the sales pace of uh, the we so-called first-time buyer product is still doing very, you know, it's, it's still selling quite rapidly. And we have not seen a substantial price correction. Uh, in the second tier city, like you know, city of Dalian, city of uh, Hefei, uh, you know, Hefei is the provincial capital city of Anhui province. So, but we do see there is a pressure from developer, particularly you know, we see uh, the news of a green town selling a pretty substantial stake to uh, to Wheelock um, to, in order to get a financing. So, but if you are a developer focusing on super luxury. And uh, those are the targets of the government's uh, cooling down measure. You might be having a problem to solve your liquidity uh, in the near term, or maybe in the medium term. We don't see the government will relax the so-called uh, you know austerity or the tightening policy on, uh, for for the residential market anytime soon. I think this is going to be the policy probably will be there for a very long period of time. So the government will keep the instrument in their hand. If something they don't like to see, for example, if the, you know, the, the, the transaction volume rebound strongly and that the developer come back to increase the price, they will put the trigger again. Mm. So uh, that's why, but, but uh, on the other hand, even you, know, you do a project on a uh, um, um, un, you know, underwriter deal conservatively, you're still enjoying 25, 30% in you know, a gross margin. And this is a good, you know, good business to be in. So, so you are... Yeah. You are very delicately of going, avoiding to hit, to come head on with the government policy, focusing in more end user, meat mass market development on residential rather than the high end. Yeah, certainly. I think in China, the lesson we learn uh, is, is don't do anything against the government's wish. <laughs> okay. Ryan, you, you, you are laughing. I mean, you, you are doing some substantial project in Shanghai and Chengdu. Um, can you tell us something about your projects and what you see compared to tier 1 city and tier 2 cities? What's the difference? What's the opportunity present to you? Sure. I think uh, I was laughing because I, I, I generally agree with Stanley. You shouldn't do anything against the government's wishes in China if you want to have a long-term viable business. Uh, I think that's a, that's a fairly good, good rule to, uh, to live by. Um, we've invested, as you mentioned, in both first tier and second tier cities. Uh, really, we look at the micro level uh, as to what the opportunity is. We're very focused on land value uh, in terms of our acquisitions because we believe that, that in a market that's very volatile, which China is, and I think you can go back over the last 10 years and see the different cycles. The cycles are very short, but because of government policy, capital coming in, capital flows, the, the uh, types of tools they have to manage the economy, there are great distortions that happen both up and down. So for us, um, we're very focused on finding investment opportunities where we think we're uniquely capable of creating value, uh, very focused on, on the entry value of what we pay for land, and that can be in, in the primary first-tier cities or in key second-tier cities where we see really strong growth potential. Uh, so as Stanley mentioned, a lot of the second-tier cities' GDP growth is far greater than the national GDP growth or what you see in, in the Tier 1 cities. And you see a significant amount of momentum now from multinational companies expanding and growing their business across China. So for many companies, you know, 10, 15 years ago, most multinational companies, their operation in China was very much export-oriented. So a manufacturing facility in the eastern seaboard and then export product back to Europe, U.S., Japan. Today, the vast majority of the companies are focused on the domestic market. Uh, and you can't service all of China from an office in Shanghai or Beijing. So you're beginning to see the development of regional economic activities. So 
Chengdu and Chongqing in the west of China, Wuhan in the center of China, down south and in the north. Uh, and, and to us, that's very interesting because in most of those markets, there's still a dearth of quality product, whether it's the office side, the retail side, uh, or, or, or even residential. Um, and so we're, we're, we're very bullish on, on both first-tier, second-tier cities, but it's really a focus on, on, on what's your entry value. Uh, and I think where we are today is, is presenting some very unique opportunities. Um, probably over the last two to three years, I think that we're at a point where uh, prices for land have come down. We're seeing, in some cases, real distress in the market, uh, mostly on small, medium-sized developers that are having a hard time getting liquidity. Uh, bank financing has dried up. Uh, for some smaller developers on the residential side, cash flows are weak because transaction volumes have fallen. So there is a consolidation that's happening in the marketplace, and I think that that does provide uh, interesting new investment opportunities moving forward. You, you must have a VC time now with China such a big geography. Um, are you focusing in the provincial towns? Because when we, when we so-called second-tier cities, it could be cover a wide range of cities with different sizes. I mean, when you say second-tier cities, you're talking about provincial capitals or a certain population size? Right. I mean, I guess for us, um, there's a couple things that we look at. First, we, we, we look at where a multinational company is growing as an indicator of a city that we would want to be in and then, uh, you know, space users who could use the type of product that we'd want to buy. We then look at also central government policy. Where is central government policy promoting growth? Uh, where is the central government investing in infrastructure? So not only subways, which are being built out uh, across China and major cities, but the high-speed train network and the rest of that. Uh, where are they building new airports, international airports? So, for instance, in Chengdu today, uh, there's direct flights to Europe, there's direct flights to Southeast Asia. Into this year, they're opening up direct flights to North America and ultimately to Australia. That changes the dynamic of a city quite dramatically. So we, we look at those, at those factors. Uh, our business model is a little bit different. We're, we're uh, a, a fund operator, but also a, a real estate operator. So we're very heavy on the human resource side. We have 150 people in China. Uh, today, and, and we like to go into cities where we feel we can build a long-term presence. So we're not really, it, it, we don't have a strategy that says we need to be in every provincial capital across China. It's really finding those cities where we feel have real long-term value, uh, and from an investment perspective, we can see ourselves doing multiple transactions. S sustainable. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Mark, uh, sitting at the far end, what's your view? My view on what? <laughs> view of what we're talking about. Just, just, just kidding. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I think if, if you take a step back and you know we look at China and say the changes most recently are they secular or are they cyclical? And interestingly enough, when you look at most countries, when you see a government policy change, you think of it as a secular change. But in China, it's cyclical. <laughs> We've seen the policy change three or four times in the last five to seven years. So obviously, as a long-term investor in China that's been involved uh, uh, for the last 10 years or so, uh, we, th we, again, think this is cyclical. So if it's cyclical, then when we're seeing prices come down, that just means it's the time to, to start looking to buy. Um, I, I do think, uh, however, the bid-ask spread is still there. I, I, the sellers are not that willing yet, right? The, the, most developers will hold on to their asset until it's the very last resort. But we're starting to see that. The small to medium-sized developers um, that cannot get the bank financing, that have trust financing, and we, we haven't talked about that topic yet, but trust financing became very prevalent in the last several years. These are the, you know, the mom and pop type of shops that put together 15 to 20 percent loans, and we'll call mezzanine or uh, the spot in between, and those are coming due. These were one-year to two-year instruments uh, that yield somewhere around, or supposed to yield around 15 percent, and they bridged the gap in the short term when the banks stopped financing. So those are not going to be available anymore, and we do think the opportunities will arise uh, from that. James? Well, I think they all, did, they all made a very, very good 
Cummins. I mean, we are like the soldiers in the field. We're, we're the deal guys. We look at the deals every day and present it to us which city and what kind of you know deals flow that we're going to have. So this is the very important situation. And right now, when you talk about the opportunity in China, is still there or, or not there? I, I can say that the the rosy days that you know uh, in the back. To, Maybe three, four years ago, you can sell 1,000 unions over a weekend. Those those days are gone, and、uh, sales speed are definitely slower. But the the market, just like Stanley just mentioned, the margin is still there. So when you are underwriting the deal, you look at the margin, and you also look at you know you you're trying not to escalate your growth rate. I mean, every year. I mean, in Back to like thinking 205, 208, 209. Every year in the major、uh, first and second tier city, the growth rate is like between 15 and 25 in different cities. And right now, when you try to underwrite a deal, you probably will do a you know single digit. And also your sales speed, and you have to be a little bit、uh, conservative. That you're not you're not trying to you know. Forecast that your sales, you know, will be down in in a matter of a three quarter or so. So it's more like become a normal market. It's like a market in 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 other countries in Asia.、Uh, when you start a pre-sale, you probably sell one third, and during the construction period, you'll sell some something more. And when product completed, and、uh, you probably will have some inventory to sell. So the market is is is、uh, become more normal, and、uh, I think it's 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 very stable and、uh, depends your selection of the. Products. I, I think most importantly, you have to be a little bit careful because you're under the home restricted, you know, time and period. So you don't want to go after luxury apartment because you know most people who can afford those、uh, t- product type usually they already have a home or two. So those just like you know a lot of Yangtze River Delta cities they have problems because the sales speed is really slow because they are the affluent you know cities in the country. So people st- start moving. Way out to Chongqing, to Chengdu, to Changsha, to Hunan. You know those area that the end user product is still very, very favorable. So that's.、Me. So there's still, all in all, there's still a lot of opportunities in different locations in China. But when you are actually getting into doing a deal,、uh, James, I mean, I want to, you to start this question. How does the banking, the financial situation now impacting you when you try to do a deal, your decision? Is it? Well, we all know that it's hard to 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 borrow money.、Um, how does all this impact when your decision to choose a deal? Is it more capital appreciation, or is it security of income, or is it a bit of both? I mean, a deal situation, yes. Well, if you if you're if you're underwriting the deal, that I'm sure that financial thing is it's always a problem that the people are going to ask you is is all that. Financing being secure. I mean, first first payment is the land payment, and this is where the opportunity for a fund like us that we will we will probably、uh, JV with our partner that、uh, we will help to finance you know part of the land land price because in China you cannot finance through the land a- a- anymore, and then the constructions that depends on your product depends on your locations and sometimes、uh, you, the developer would would say we can use. Proceeds from the from the pre-sales and to support the construction. But even though you still need to have a certain you know portion of、uh, construction financing in place to be able to go into the deal, so you want to be a, a little bit more con- conservative. And particularly, you have to be really careful when you get into a really large deal. Then、uh, that require a huge construction. Uh, cost because you cannot you cannot have an incomplete project that you already you know really complete 20% of your project and you're out of cash and you cannot sell and then you are then you are stuck. So I think you have to be a little bit more conservative on the financing side. Okay.、Um, Ryan, I mean, you are a fund manager as well as a real estate operator, developer.、Um, how does the financial situation will? Otherwise, change your decision if you're doing a deal now. Well, look, I think、um, financing is available. It's certainly much more expensive than it used to be. I think、uh, five-year PBOC loan is 6.65 percent. It used to be a, two years ago you'd be able to borrow at flat PBOC or a discount to that. 
Today, um, it, it's at 1.2 times, 1.3 times, and sometimes greater. Um, so, so clearly, underwriting standards have to change to reflect a higher cost of, of debt financing. Um, what we've seen, and I, and I think you know, the, the area that you have to be somewhat careful is over the last year and a half, uh, as the government has tightened the market, taken liquidity out of the market, reduced bank allocations, um, banks in some cases have not been able to fund developments. And we, we've seen that um, in some projects in China where uh, a developer may be under construction and then, and then uh, the bank be unable to fund a monthly loan draw just because it doesn't have that allocation. That's beginning to now change. You know, since the beginning of this year or end of last year, we've had now three reductions uh, in the bank reserve ratio. Uh, they cut interest rates for the first time in three years and at the beginning of June. So we're beginning to see a little bit more liquidity put into the market. That really hasn't yet flown, uh, hasn't come through too much into real estate, but you're beginning to see that, that dynamic. So I, I think on the bank tightening dynamics, we're, we're, we're towards the end of that, end of that cycle. Um, but, you know, in the near term, it does mean you have to underwrite just a, a higher cost of debt on new transactions that you look at. Richard, any comments on that? Yeah, the, um, we, we focus very much on uh, value add and uh, opportunistic deals, development deals. Um, if you look at, at core, um, we feel that for international capital, the, the yields are too low. And with, uh, um, as, as was just said, the, uh, the interest cost at this moment being 8.5%, it, it just doesn't make sense. Um, on the development side, um, indeed, now, but also over the last two years, we were able to get financing. And our financing level, also in the years before on development deals, has always been relatively low. If you took the total uh, loan to value, you talk about 30%, maybe 40%. Um, and for good development projects, banks have been and are providing those loans. We develop together with partners. In fact, our partners develop and we are a investor in a development vehicle. Um, and good developers in China, reputable developers, well-led developers, are not and have not been in any kind of serious cash situation, cash need situation. Um, if you go to the more mid and smaller developers, that is the case. And you can see that starting to happen or have happened but they are not our partners. So from a, a financing point of view, um, the kind of tightening uh, of banks uh, induced by the government has not really affected us or our partners to undertake good projects. Uh, I mean, you are, you also develop, I understand. You also, you're not just like a, fund manager, you, you into development and lower to big scale ones. I'm sure your experience might be slightly different from Richard's experience yeah, on the financing bit, side. Yeah, but similar in the sense that um, um, we don't have too much difficulty in getting financing. Um, also, like I said from the beginning, that we started off with um, uh, a bigger scale development starting from industrial and all that, which is um, well received by the government and the authorities. So it's easier for us to get financing in that sense. Um, the other part is also um, we are maybe a little bit longer term. Um, before we get the land, we also participate in the master planning and stuff with the local authorities. and. There is a lot of groundwork being done already. So when it's time for us to get the loans and stuff, it's, it's not, not as challenging as some other people. I always heard that um, Singaporean investors are at an advantage because it's easier to get finance. Is it true? <laughs> <laughs> I have no complaints. But <laughs> Stanley, I mean, your, your projects, I mean, um, how do you play with it? Well, um, a real life experience that we had is um, last year we, um, you know, for our investment, we we actually 
um, need to get a financing. So we actually get a financing proposal from a domestic bank, which, as you would guess, you know, the all in is about nine to ten percent per annum, which is unbelievably high. So luckily that we have a offshore structure that will allow us to do some financing offshore, uh, which at the end, at the end we you know, get a loan at all in of 5% uh, in the US dollar. So basically I think going forward, uh, the tightening, yes, we see probably there will be some relaxation in the bank's liquidity. But, but the overall trend, I think the tightening will still be there for, for a while. So, um, you know, investors like, you know, managers like us, we have to be really prepared for, for the worst. And, the, you know, for us, it's always keep our, our options open, uh, offshore and onshore structure. And then certainly, you know, we have to underwrite the, for the worst. If, you know, the loan will not come, can we continue our investment? You know, is this still something that we, we can do? So uh, if, you know, we, we, without any financing, we can still carry on this project. I think you know certainly the risk is much lower, but uh, I think the overall uh, strategy is to do it very conservatively. Yeah, but at the same time, I think you know this liquidity uh, squeeze will drive a lot of smaller developers out of business. You know, forcing them to sell their quality assets at a reasonable price. So at the same time, we will offer great opportunities to us as well. This morning, the um, some of the speakers were talking about. Uh, Difficulties in, in, in raising funds, for example, from, 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 from Europe, okay? People are sort of waiting to see how things are going to develop, okay? With the fact that the, the fundraising pro process is different from before, um, are your investment strategies sort of different because your investor expecting different from you? Or otherwise, you're telling investors, don't worry, this is what I will do. This is the best for you. What is it like now? I mean, Mark. No, I, I don't think, um, at least from an investment strategy standpoint, we're, again, just a similar theme, which is you're not going to change your investment thing. Uh, excuse me. Oh. Your investment strategy based on what, what is perceived to be, obviously, a, a slight disruption or a, a pretty significant disruption in the uh, financial markets. Um, I think those on the panel today and most of you in the room still have access to capital, right? And, and be it onshore or offshore, we, we still have access. Um, unlike the developers on the, on the panel, uh, though, we only focus on commercial assets. So I, I'll flip it around where saying the liquidity onshore has tightened, but the small to medium-sized developers are the ones that are experiencing problems. And what used to be able to be funded through bank debt in terms of a land acquisition in the initial construction phase is not available right now. And that's where we see the opportunity. So one example would be on a mixed-use property that has retail residential office. The residential developer would have typically built out the residential and then funded the office and the retail through the profits of the residential. That model has gone away for a lot of many of these smaller developers who can't get the bank liquidity. So resultingly, at least for several of us, the op that's where the opportunity uh, is most prevalent right now, where, again, Unlike us, where we have access offshore, their access is limited, and then we go in and provide the capital for the resi build-out or the um, uh, commercial build-out, and that funds their residential versus what they were able to access from the banks before. James, you want to add? James, want to, add to that? Um, I just say that the financing is tight, and it probably will still be a little bit uh, tight for the next six, maybe 12 months, but I, I think that right now the government has all different uh, strategy and try to maintain the GDP growth. So we have seen certain you know, uh, situation that uh, rate of reserve has been dropped a couple more times. And, and I think this year will probably developer will have easier ways to have access to bank financing. And when we do deals, we, we have to be very careful to choose who will be our partner. And our partner should probably have a certain characteristics that they usually have a good government relationship. They usually have a good uh, bank, banking re relationship. At least, you know, all the major developers, they say, with the main four banks, they all keep a very good relationship. So when, when there's any time when the worst situation comes, they, we will still be able to finance the deal through the, through the bank or, or, or even the trust. Because 
equity is the most ex most expensive. So, if you can get financing from the bank, and that that money is is always is always cheaper. Um, recently, I've when I talked to uh, different investors, um, I, I was receiving very mixed up messages about um, where to put their money. I heard some people telling me Japan is no good because the economy is no good, but I also heard another, another fund told me that they're looking to buy in Japan because borrowing cost is very low. The return actually can, can pay off the cost. They're looking for fixed return, okay? And how attractive or how challenging is now talking to your investors about investing in China? I mean, what is attraction to them now? I also heard people saying that the States is very cheap, it's, it's, it's about time to go back to, to the United States, and then China maybe steel price hasn't really come off, you know, relatively sounds expensive. What is it now? I mean, how, I mean, looks quite mixed up messages, mixed up picture. I mean, Richard, I mean, what, what is your read on that? Maybe, maybe first one step back relating to the start of your, uh, your question. Um, I think, I mean, all of us obviously work for different companies with different strengths and weaknesses. I think the most important thing with regards to any kind of investment strategy, we also say, did you change your strategies because of, of uh, tighter capital markets? You need to have a strategy which you can execute and execute where your company is able to deliver good returns. We can't do everything everywhere. You need to be selective. And for us, um, investing in, in China relates to a couple of elements. First, make sure that your land price is cheap. Very basic, we focus on opportunistic, land price need to be cheap. This is the time where land prices are cheap. Secondly, you need to be able to execute. You need to be able to execute a development deal. Thirdly, you need to have an exit. Very simply, those are the three main ingredients. And for us, with, with our setup in China, and the fact that we want to cover the whole of China because of, of diversification of risk, we team up with local developers. We select them, we select them in areas where we feel they're strong. That is an investment strategy which, regardless of what capital markets outside of China do, we feel at this moment is attractive, and we also feel that we are very capable and very experienced in dealing with those kind of partnerships. Different companies have different strategies, have different ways of, of approaching that. So that is primarily, I think, one of the most important things. Look at, at your company, see where your strengths are, and then have a way of executing it. And, and for us, the exit of projects in China is one of the most important things. So all the deals we structure, we have a prearranged exit included into it. So we know we can get out. Um, and although capital markets in China are developing and you get more institutional investors, it still is something which is, um, we fail quite a high risk. Then with regards to, to capital markets outside, how do investors look at China? What are their concerns? I think very um, generalizing, uh, many of the investors in Europe and in the States have gone through a significant period of shock over the last couple of years. And um, prices have tumbled, uh, debt levels has gone through the roof, um, liquidity has tightened, and when they now look at China, they expect, in fact, the same thing to happen. And they see prices coming down, prices have come down. And very often, the conclusion is China will go through the same period as we have just behind us. Um, and I think there lies the challenge for investors like us to um, indicate to them, um, to explain that the whole reasoning of pricing coming down, volumes dropping, is not because of a poor market, it's not because of poor fundamentals, it's the opposite. It's because the market is so strong that the government had to intervene to cool it off. 
And um, I think that when that becomes clear, and you can see that, especially with more experienced investors at this moment, mainly from the States, that that, that tightness in money in the capital markets will reverse and that money will start flowing in. My hope is that it happens on time and not when the market is already taking off. Okay. Any echo on uh, Richard's coming? Anyone? I guess I, I guess I would just add that I think uh, we've seen a change in some investor mindset from 2005, 2006, 2007. Uh, you know, in that in that time frame, a lot of foreign investors looking into China were, were really very opportunistic, wanting to put their toes in the water, understand to get their money in, get their money out, um, and very unsure about what's happening. Uh, today, I think there's sort of a, 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 a split between two, two types of investors. There's those that have been invested in China before, uh, some of the larger investors, many of whom have moved operations uh, to Asia or a component of their business to Asia that wasn't there in 2003, 2004, 2005. For many of those investors, um, there's a sense that they would actually like to be long the market in China. So their time frames change, not, not only just looking at opportunistic investments, but, but looking at, at investing for the long term, really believing in the China growth story, that we're in the middle of it, not towards the end of it, and there's still great opportunities ahead. Um, and and I, I think that those investors are fairly sophisticated. They understand the market. They spent some time on looking at it and, and the rest of that. And so that's, that's one set, and, and that's certainly a, 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 a source of capital that really didn't exist 10 years ago. The other set, um, there's a group that, that read what's been printed in, in the newspapers, the headlines, um, and are very much caught up in what's happening in, in Europe and, and the U.S. And, and I think you know Richard's talked a little bit about, about that dynamic. Um, but we are, we are seeing a lot more sophistication in terms of the understanding of this market, in terms of the challenges and, and the long-term growth opportunity as well. Stanley. Well, I think your question is about, you know, how to convince the investor to, to invest in China. Um, honestly, if uh, we you know, have a meeting with the investor, come with the bubble question and with you know, why China, I don't think you have a very low chance. I think you have a very low chance to get them to invest. I think it, we are, you know, investors is changing. Uh, basically, uh, they're getting more sophisticated. They, get, they had, hopefully, pretty good experience uh, investing in China before or they start to look at you know, investment opportunities. They wanted to see a manager um, who, is, who is very determined, who is uh, established, and who is committed. And uh, as well as the sector you know, go along with the economic development of China. So I think a lot of people now looking at the logistics, retails, and uh, probably you know, still there are the investors interested in residential. But those are the investors, they are sophisticated enough, they understand the market. It's not our job to pitch them why you have to invest in China in this sector. Instead, they are coming to the fundamental. Why should I choose you as a manager? Because we basically understand you know, the fundamental of China. So those are the major changes, of, I think, over the last few years. Particularly, I think, if we look at, the, in, based on our experience, 05, 06 vintage funds, they are doing extremely well, return all the capital plus good return to the investors. If you look at the vintage of 06, 05, 06, 07, you know, which fund can beat their performance in China? Not many of them. But I think you know, all the people here, we are doing reasonably well. But basically, I think it's based, you know, you wanted to find a manager who understand the market as well as had good execution capability. That's the key, execution. So investors are very smart. I mean, they pay you because you're very good at what you're doing. Okay. Um, I mean, time's running short. Um, I would like every one of you to spend maybe a minute or maybe two minutes just to tell your advice to our audience here. If they're looking to, in, to invest in this market, what they should do, your experience, or what they shouldn't do or where? Open question, but stuff from James. I think uh, China still have a lot of uh, opportunities. Uh, I can think about a few things that investors that shouldn't do. 
there are so many different cities in China, and a lot of city has population over five, ten million, and it, it it all looks like this is a great place to for investment. But you have to think about your limitations. Geographically, China is so big, and the second part, once you deploy your money, then asset management become a very very major issue. So you have to be careful. Think about your presence in China and what are the city that you can you can really travel back and forth and really do that as a management correctly and exit right. That's how geographically will affect your investment. And the second thing I'll say, for every city, because urbanization that creates new opportunity, city will usually have a new territory, new land, and a new town, and uh, from the center CBD, and you have to be careful to s select whether you want to go into that category or not. And particularly some, some city, they will use plot ratio over four, then you have to think about, oh, that land price is really high, but uh, when you when you think about plot ratio in uh, you know half an hour away from the C CBD, and you have to be a little bit cautious. And there are also certain cities you have to look at supply and demand. Although the land price is really cheap, but there's a huge territory uh, cover a big area of land that is coming out in 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 12 months or 18 months, and you can think about the supply of that area is really big, and you cannot command a very good Selling price that you have to be careful as well. Okay, Stanley. Well, <laughs> my suggestion is to be straightforward. Uh, I think you know if uh, if if you wanted to indirect investment, then find a manager that uh, who is capable of, of of doing things in China with good execution capability and track records. You want to go direct, find the right partner because at the end of the day, it's the counterparty risk. So no matter you know how attractive the deal is. At the end of the day, you need to get an exit, and it's counterparty kind of risk in the end. So go straight forward, and uh, you know this is I uh, don't do deals because you know sometimes people think if they can use the Western structure and the to structure the deal, and you find yourself probably in trouble at the end because it's totally different. So different places, different rules, right? Yeah, I, I think it's a little presumptuous of us to tell investors what, what, what they should do. Um, but, but I would say I think it's incredibly important to focus on execution. Uh, everybody understands, I think, that the, the, the macro story of China, which is why it's exciting to invest, the urbanization story, wealth creation, and the rest of it. But you, you really don't make your money in the macro story. It, it's on the micro. It's on, it's on the execution side of the investment. And, uh, I, you know, I, I think... All of us who have been involved in investing in China know that the market can be challenging. Uh, things change. The environment changes. Regulations change. You, you really have to be able to manage your investments through that time frame. So uh, uh, as Stanley said, you, you find a manager or, or you build a team, but you really have to focus on, on execution. Richard. Yeah, what can I add to that? No, I think um, three elements. I think first an investor needs to look at his time horizon. If your time horizon is short, a period of five to seven years, the way, the way you should look at the type of investments you make is very different when you have a time horizon of 10 years or 15 years. Um, I think with that also, if your time horizon is short, core investments, I think are very difficult to make money out of. Right? The, the yields are not very high. Uh, maybe with a bit of luck you can ride a cycle, but, um, but for a longer term, I think if you're a long-term investor, core in China can be very interesting in first-tier cities and in second-tier cities. So if you then look at the alternatives, I think you talk about value add, you talk about op opportunistic investments. I think that China over the years to come will offer enormous, and still at this moment is already, offering enormous opportunities for value-add investments. The city centers are growing. They're growing very fast. Land in the cities is scarce. Um, a lot of buildings have been built over the last 10, 20 years, poor quality, fantastic location, but poor quality. And you've got a huge opportunity to buy them because many of the owners of those kind of properties are those owners which at the moment are being squeezed these are not property investors, these are trading companies, these are maybe manufacturing companies who had a piece of land and built something on it. They are squeezed, 
and they're willing to sell. So that is an opportunity to buy, turn around the building, uh, upgrade it, and I think have, have very good um, uh, value-add returns. And then thirdly, of course, opportunistic, which has always been one of our major um, focuses in China, um, in, in, in indeed first, second, and uh, third tier cities. And as, as the other panelists said, execution, for me, I said it before, three elements. Land needs to be cheap, execution, you need to have a track record, you need to be experienced, you need to be able to do it. And for a, and I call it short-term investor of five years or six years, exit. Exit is one of the most important things. And if you haven't arranged or pre-arranged an exit, your risk level goes up enormously. So the deals we like to do, in the, even in the opportunistic arena, we try to pre-arrange our exit. I mean, Comment. Um, yeah, I share the, the, the thoughts shared by everyone here. But, uh, and, but in addition to all that, I, I think the, if I were an investor looking into China, and um, the, the good thing about it is that there's less people to choose from because all the weaker ones have gone away. Um, the, the stronger ones are left. Um, so from there, I think um, you would definitely look at what uh, everybody has shared. But also the other one is which one would be able to um, uh, align themselves closer to the investor. I mean, there, there are many structures, there are many ways of doing things. Uh, one is like, as Richard said, um, if they've come out with very good exit strategies, put things in place, that's more investor friendly and, you know, rather than too risky or speculative. The other can be uh, more of the fund manager or the teams putting their own equity into the, into the pot, it's stuff like that, right? And larger sponsor stake. So these are the things. Thanks, Mark. And after five of my distinguished colleagues go, it's really hard to say something that's, that's, that's new, but I, I, I think um, the one that if you haven't invested in China is, and this one's, uh, I think the most critical for, for us, which is your partner. Um, the letter of the law does not necessarily get followed in China. <laughs> you need to trust your partner, and your partner is the one that is going to be the one that actually, at the end of the day, helps you develop, helps you market, and, and all those things. So um, we have seen many other situations where um, fast and loose doesn't win. It doesn't win. The returns may look very high, but if, you, if the partner is not one that's very trustworthy, you better be careful. Well, very good opinions. From the audience, any, any questions? If you, any interests, any you'd like to ask? Any questions? So mic's coming. Good members of the panel uh, share with us their experiences in exits in China other than housing, and what's the outlook for exits other than housing in China? Richard, talk about exits. You yeah, were talking I about it. Up, so I, I stuck my neck out. So I better take the uh, take the first answer to it. Um, strata title exit. First on a project basis, right? You've got your strata title exit where you sell to end users or, or to investors. Um, secondly, when you invest in a joint venture, uh, you can structure your joint venture in such a way that you have a put option towards a certain end date or when a certain percentage of a project is being sold. Um, but at project level, I think the at this moment in time, the most secure exit you have is strata title. Of course, the housing market is well known for it, but not just the housing market. You have retail and office buildings with a strata titled. But we can all see in China that the investor market is maturing. And that means that you now have institutional investors. And I'm not talking just about the, the big government uh, um, uh, wealth funds or, or pension funds but also insurance companies who are being allowed now to enter into the market. And their current exposure to real estate is minimal. They have, over the next five to 10 years, an enormous catch-up to do, 
even if they want to come to three or four percent of their um, available uh, assets to be to be placed into to real estate so there is going to be and you can already see that happening a institutional market developing in China um, who will be able to take on block office buildings hotels uh, retail malls for income generation thirdly and and this is a little bit a broken record over the last 10 years the REIT market in China it doesn't exist it doesn't exist seven eight years ago we all thought it would be there within a year it didn't seven years ago we thought it would be in there for a year it didn't um, but it will it will happen over time at this moment it will not because it, it will fuel the market and it's exactly against the government policies but a REIT market will develop because there are very few products for Chinese to really invest in and get a, a stable income uh, return. Um, so I think at this moment, the, of course you've got the international investors, but international investors in the whole of the Chinese real estate market, although when you look here at, at the panel, um, you'll find international investors, but we are just a drop. The real market is being determined by Chinese investors. And I think at this moment, the bulk is strata title sale, and it is very strong, but institutional investors from China are entering into the market. And I think that if you've got a horizon of seven years, that that will not be a, a high risk scenario. Any other questions? Well, we're running late. If there's no more questions, um, please join me in Thank you to the panelists for sharing us all the valuable opinions. Mm -hmm.